at the moment, uh, Queensland's in, in the worst drought on record. So, mm -hmm. we're, uh, so in our area alone, we've got uh, about 600 farms that have been destocked for three years. So in terms of cash flow, there's, there's none at all. Um, it's quite, it's quite, quite the challenge. So initially, we all sort of looked for uh, leadership. So we looked to industry bodies, to government, to, to actually um, lead us through, through the situation. And uh, their resources were just, uh, you know, starved because you just can't, 600 farms, it, we've, we've done an estimation at the moment and there's about $1.5 million per farm to restock. So uh, collectively, 600 uh, farms, it's, it's quite a significant amount of money. And, you know, it, it would be interesting to see uh, corporate engagement to try and finance that situation. So now, three years on, uh, we're, we've got a notion now, um, instead of the power of one and looking to industry leadership, we're looking uh, at each other and we've got a notion uh, called uh, the power of one times many. So it's sort of the notion of AgriHive as well because it, it's up to all individuals to take responsibility and, uh, and empower their situation. Um, and I, I believe that's, um, you know, that's what we're here about today. Um, and especially uh, across uh, Agri, uh, across the network, we're live streaming so, and we're recording the videos and we're opening up a competition to, to everyone to actually share their knowledge. Um, so it's about the collective and not the individual. So I think that's an opportunity to flip the way um, agricultural industries deal with, with crisis and situation. Um, and uh, when we put this together, I thought it would be great to get somebody from outside of agriculture that's got an affinity and affection for it to actually come and talk about leadership here um, to us all today and, and to the greater community. So um, I'd, I'd just like to introduce uh, Dr. Brian Waters. He's a senior lecturer at, in leadership at Cranfield Defence and Security, Cranfield University. Prior to joining Cranfield, Brian had a very successful and challenging career in the British Army. Having commanded the 1st Battalion, the Cheshire Regiment, he was Director of Military Studies uh, Colonel Training at the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst, a member of the Directing Staff at the Joint Services Command and Staff College, Advanced Command and Staff Course. Uh, founding Director of the Ministry of Defence Strategic Leadership Program and Vice President of the Army Officer Selection Board. Indirect leadership roles culminating in a one-star brigadier's appointment on General Petraeus' staff in, U in Iraq. Brian has commanded on active service in a number of theatres, including Northern Ireland, Rhodesia, Belize, uh, Bosnia, Iraq and Kosovo. His leadership has been formally recognised on three occasions. In the, U in the UK's Operational Honours and Awards list and in 2005 he was awarded the Legion of Merit officer by the United States. So uh, we're tremendously privileged to have uh, Dr. Brian Waters here today and I'd just like to pass on to him and uh, show your appreciation for him. Thank you very much. That's an awful lot to live up to. Um, I would just like to begin by saying thank you for what you do. Um, the reason I joined the British Army is the two farms my grandparents farmed in Ireland were too small for me to inherit one of them. So I had to go and join the army. And so I've been a frustrated farmer ever since. And I do have an empathy with what you do. And it's a great privilege to uh, speak uh, each year at um, the, the Leadership and Agriculture Program uh, funded by the, uh, the Farmers uh, Union down in um, the West Country. Um, and it was out of that where I met James, and that's why I think I'm here today. I hate standing still, so I'm going to move around a bit. Um, I've been asked to talk about change, and that's one of the things that I specialize in at the university. I run an MSc in leadership for the Ministry of Defense, so the Ministry of Defense pay for 25 serving military and civil servants each year to come and do this master's degree. And I run a strategic leadership program in 19 different countries. Um, next week, I'm in Bangladesh and Burma. I'm going to talk about planning and leading change. I'm going to introduce some ideas. I'm going to introduce some frameworks for analysis that I've used to make sense of contexts that I've been trying to influence or change. And I'm going to share those with you. I've tried to put a dairy spin on a couple of them as a consumer, an admirer, and, and somebody who looks on with a degree of frustration. As a, as a young officer uh, on a course with a special air service in 1975, every naffy break, every 11 o'clock in the morning, we went to the naffy and we drank a pint of cold milk and ate a bun. I put soldiers drinking milk into Google this morning, and I could only find one picture from 1942. 
And so what's happened to the drinking of milk? Um, we probably now do smoothies and energy drinks, and I'll talk about that. Um, I'd like you to think about the word change for a moment. I'd also like you to think about a problem that you're currently grappling with. And how would you describe that problem? I'm not going to return to that question again, but maybe at the end of my lecture, you might like to reflect on your problem and how you might reframe it as a result of the lecture. It's an emotive word. It intellectually challenges us and it emotionally challenges us. It tends to hit us physiologically and psychologically. Ontology, where words come from, is really important in my line of work. We need to make sure we're all speaking the same language. The word change is fascinating. It comes from that group of people that invaded us in 1066. Um, and its roots are in Latin. It's about altering the state of, and it's about exchange and bartering. That's what change means. Exchange and barter. I'm going to talk about some theories and the relevance of theory. Some people don't think theory is relevant. Theory is very relevant when things don't work. But to worry about theory. When they don't work, we seek answers in theory. This is a guy who was a general in the Prussian army dealing with a catastrophic event. The Prussians, the most powerful army on the planet in the beginning of the 19th century, were beaten by a raggedy taggedy bunch of Frenchmen led by a little guy. And you can't imagine the global shock of that. And afterwards, Karl von Clausewitz tried to make sense of how a post-revolutionary French army had beaten the most powerful army on the planet, the Prussians. And he spent his life trying to understand it. And after his death, his wife pulled together his thoughts and published them in a book called On War, Von Krieg. And this is what he talks about theory. It lights up the road. Each of us doesn't come at it from the same position. It educates the mind of the future leader. But you can't take it with you into work. So theory is something that you learn and you practically apply. I want to talk about problems just for a moment. I've been listening to a lot of problems over the last couple of hours. And I got a sense that people were framing problems. They were framing them. The problem of defining problems is knowing what distinguishes an observed condition from a desired condition. So where do we get from where we are to where we want to be? How do we do it? How do we understand the complex causal networks where the trouble really lies? How do we do that? How do we make sense of it? Aristotle, a Greek philosopher, called it phrenesis, practical wisdom. How do we get practical wisdom on the farm in the agricultural industry? How do we understand the simple problem through the complex causal networks? And then how do we get to where we want to be from where we are? And I'm going to introduce something to planners. Has anyone come across tame and wicked problems before as a way of thinking about problems? Yeah? Um, it, quite a while ago, uh, and I only wish I'd read it earlier, Rittle and Weber, two planners, Americans, and what they said was that you can think about problems in two ways. One is tame problems, and they're the ones we like. And I've heard lots of tame problems today. And tame problems are really understood as problems that have solutions. You've got to get to the solution, and you know the problem is solved when the problem is solved. You've milked the cows. You've sold the milk. The problem's solved. You need to bridge a gap. You need to dig a drain. You know the problem's solved when it's done. And we like them because we're innately completer finishers as human beings. We love to finish what we do. We love to have a closure. And so we tend to frame problems as tame because then we can deal with them, as opposed to what Rittle and Weber called wicked problems. And wicked problems are the opposite of tame. They're not evil. It's just a rather unfortunate term. It doesn't translate very well into many languages. These are the sort of problems that don't have any solution at all. The price of milk. What is the answer to that problem, the price of milk? There isn't one. There never has been. In my world, I look at things like security. What is the solution to national security? There never has been one. What's the 
answer to the security of your farm. There never has been an answer to the security of your farm and your equipment. It is a wicked problem. Riddle Merber in their paper give 10 explanations of a wicked problem. And essentially what they say is a wicked problem is a problem that's connected to another problem that's connected to another problem that's connected to another problem to infinity. Every time you try and tackle the problem, you cause a series of unknown causes and effects. And until the ripples of consequence of each action take in part of the problem run its course, you can't understand how it's affected the bigger problem. And we don't like wicked problems for that very reason. So we tend to tame them. So we tame wicked problems. And in so doing, we then ignore the wider wicked problem. In fact, in their paper, Rittle and Weber argue that it's immoral to try and tame a wicked problem. We should understand the difference, tackle tame problems and solve them, and then manage the bigger wicked problem, like climate change. We just manage the bigger wicked problem. Setting the tax rate, setting subsidies. They're wicked problems. No one's ever come up with a solution. A colleague of mine at Warwick University, Keith Grint. Keith took this um, as a result of a, a case study uh, that, that we talked through together on Bosnia, of all places. Um, and Keith began to look at how you manage, how you handle, how you do the solving of tame and wicked problems. And he said, if they're real and objective, then if they're a wicked problem, we must lead them. And by lead, what he meant is we have to build consensus to understand the problem. And so if you take setting the price of milk or the cost of milk production as a wicked problem, it's a problem that's linked to another, linked to another, linked to another. And we heard from James, you know, linked to climate. It's linked to everything. Currency exchange. Loads of variables over which you have no control. Therefore, you have to build as large a group of people as you can find to build consensus, to understand the scope and wickedness of the problem. And you can't govern those people. You can only influence them because you don't have control or authority over them. So you can't command them. You can't wreck them. You can just influence them. And so it's about building a large influence group and that group working together to manage the wicked problem. If it's a tame problem, it can be managed. There is a series of standard operational procedures that somebody knows that will solve the problem. And then he introduced the third type of problem, a crisis, a critical problem. So tame, wicked, and now critical. And a critical problem is a crisis. You must identify it as a crisis and deal with it as a crisis. You must command it. You must direct it. Nobody in a crisis wants a committee to deal with the problem. They want a commander, somebody to take charge. This makes the assumption that these problems are real. But we also socially construct problems. We create problems we like to deal with. If we are a natural builder of consensus, we love forming committees to worry about problems. And so we socially construct problems to be wicked. If we like managing problems through procedures, we socially construct them to be tame. If we are innately a commander and we like taking charge and shouting at people, we construct them to be a crisis. I work for lots of people like that. The military attracts them. And so is the problem real or is the problem socially constructed? So we need to make those decisions. I'm now going to look a little bit at context. Do we understand the context in which we're operating? Do we understand the terrain through which we are maneuvering? And so the idea of looking at context provides a structure. It allows then to formulate options and set priorities. This is the sort of thing that we do in international relations and in international security. We generally work about 30 years out. We look at a series of trends, resources, social, political, technological, and economic. We look at the shocks in the near term that are going to influence them and how they go into the probable, the alternative, and the plausible out to 30 years. And this is a piece of work that's constantly done in the Ministry of Defense, and it shares it with all the other ministries. 
I don't know if you're doing that in agriculture. If you have, and somebody talked about running a business with five and 10 year plans, I would think 30 year plans are a minimum. And the further out you go, the more probable rather than plausible they become. So how do we understand then this terrain, the internal and the external environment? I gave it a bit of thought on Google Images. 1998 Google was invented. What did we do before 1998? It was a real puzzle. My children don't know. I remember used to get a book. Um, but now I use Google Images, very powerful. And so I was thinking, well, what is the environment that the dairy industry is operating in? When I went to the NAFI in 1975, none of this stuff existed. How on earth do people pay good money for water in fancy bottles? How has somebody managed to convince us to do that? I was in a restaurant the other day, and they were drinking this stuff. And it was two pounds a bottle for water. Both my children drink this stuff, soya and almond. They're not allergic to anything. It's trendy. It's fashionable. Smoothies. These things here. When I was colonel training at Sandhurst, one of our cadets died on a run. He drank two litres of that before he did his run. It takes two litres of bodily seminal fluid to digest one can of that drink. And he dehydrated and died. Um, I banned it. I ended up on page three of the sun, not the topless one, but the, because I banned that drink from Sandhurst. Apparently, I wasn't allowed to. Um, this stuff here, I quite enjoy gin and tonic. How on earth has this industry transformed this stuff into this stuff? And you're paying 45 pounds for 70 centiliters of gin in a fancy bottle. It's still gin. But how have they done it? I don't know. But they have. But all that's happened here is that's gone to that. So what on earth are you doing about it? Why aren't you doing more of this? I just had a thought, single farm milk. That's like Hilden water, isn't it? Single source milk. Must be great, because it's a single source from a known herd, from a known farmer. Must be worth paying five quid a litre for, like you do for water. Single breed milk. Cheshire milk, because I grew up with dairy farming boys from Cheshire. Devon milk. I've got a mate who's a farmer in Devon. We, I, don't, I don't see any of that. All I see is, is this. And it's not even ecologically sound. I mean, we should be being made to pay more for plastic bottles like we now are for plastic bags, because they're bad for the environment. But you put your milk in these bad for the environment containers. Why? They're bad for the environment. My wife loathes them. She says they leak in her shopping. So I don't know where we've gone. 1975, a pint of cold milk every naffy break, every working day of the week. And I loved it. I can't get a pint of cold milk to save my life in the naffy now. I can get all sorts of frappuccinos and things. So that was the only picture I could find of soldiers drinking milk. 1942. So there's something strange going on. Um, and what's going on is something that the Business schools, when I teach on our MBA, this is one of my favorite tools. I use this to convince my general in Iraq that we were facing strategic failure. I simply use this model. It's very powerful. Amount of change over time. That's the external environmental rate of change. That's your smoothies, your bottled waters, your funny nut milk. <coughs> it's market forces. It's government policies. It's EU policies, it's weather trends, it's everything. And then we tend to incrementally change. We tend to incrementally change. And so every little rest from change, because we can't change all the time, can we? Because we need to rest from change. So every rest from change, we fall one unit further behind the environmental rate of change, because the external rate of change doesn't stop. It keeps going. So while we take a rest from change, it doesn't. And so 
we fall behind. And it doesn't matter what your business, your industry, your ministry is, you fall behind the external rate of change. This is what research shows us. And then we reach a crisis point where we enter what is called a state of flux. And these are when we do short, sharp changes of change. It's not working, we'll change again. That isn't working, we're going to change again. And we get into a bit of a crisis. And as we're doing that, we get further and further and further away from the external rate of change, putting milk into <coughs> plastic bottles. And then we reach a crisis. And in the crisis, we've got to do one of two things. We've either got to do what they call a step change to get back up to where the market is, or we face annihilation. Really clever organizations avoid this trap. And what they do is, sensing weak signals in the market, they innovate and get ahead of the market. Take um, the iPad. I mean, I've seen a few being used at the moment. What on earth is an iPad? When did we discover we needed an iPad? We didn't. But Jobs knew we needed an iPad. And his design team knew we needed an iPad. So they developed an iPad and they marketed it. And my wife has to have two. One that can fit in a handbag for some reason. GE, General Electric, years ago, got out of white goods, got into banking, computers, jet engines, at a time when they were making billions of dollars out of white goods. Because Jack Walsh saw weak signals in the Middle Eastern market. He saw that the Middle East was going to start, sorry, the Far East, was going to start producing white goods, fridges, freezers, and washing machines, cheaper than GE could, to the same quality. And whilst the Americans are very loyal, they're not going to pay twice the price for their white goods when the reliability is the same. So he got out of it. And he had the finance within GE to be able to undertake the transition. And GE are transitioning again as we speak. And so I don't know, where are the weak signals in your industry that allow preemptive innovation? Or are we going to wait until we get to the crisis before we are driven to change, like a mobile phone company called Nokia? Um, burning platform memo, just put it into Google. Um, it was a memo sent out by the CEO of Nokia telling his entire company that if they didn't change, if they didn't stop resisting the move to this new style of mobile phone, the company would cease to exist. It was a crisis, so they had to do a step change. A very powerful, very simple model. Um, you might think about using it. And so I'm sure you've come across some of these tools before, the, the business school tools to understand the external and internal environment, things like PESTLE, things like SWOT analysis, and risk maps. Um, so having understood the external environment, and we realize we have to change to keep pace with it, how do we change? It's about people, and we've heard a lot about that this morning. I like to say you lead people through change and you manage the process of change. You've got to get both right. You can be a beautifully charismatic, confidence-building leader with lousy processes and your change will fail. You can be a brilliant master of the Gantt chart and lousy people skills, not convince the people to change, and the change won't happen. That's what research tells us. So it's about context, culture, and process. But most of all, it's about people. And you know people don't look like that at all. They're, they're not in serried rows, you know, easily understood. They don't live in organograms where everything is neat and tidy. People are just people. And they're all intermuddled. They're interrelated. You make a change in this part of the organization, you think that's isolated in that part of the organization. But it isn't because somebody's married to somebody in this part of the organization, and it upsets that part of the organization. And so it's about understanding people. Also, change, research shows us, happens simultaneously across every level, from the environment to the individual. And when you're dealing with individuals, you're dealing with their physiology as well as their psychology. We are physiologically programmed not to want to change. We don't like it. Our brain doesn't like change. The most horrendous example of that was when I was working in counterterrorism in Northern Ireland in the mid-'80s. And the Irish Republican Army were targeting critical key people that were involved in building a process towards an accommodation. And so we contacted these critical key people and showed them how to stay alive and defeat the IRA's assassination attempts. It meant living random lives. 
and people don't like living random lives. And by random, I mean you had two dice. The first roll of the dice is what time you left your house. The second roll of the dice is what route you took to work. Six permeables times six. Can you imagine living your life like that, never knowing when you went to bed what time you were getting up until you rolled the dice just before you went to sleep? It lasted for most people about three weeks, and then they went back to their routine, and they were assassinated. <laughs> because the IRA simply got inside their routine and knew they could place them in time and space somewhere to kill them. So people knew that they run, ran the risk of dying, but they still couldn't cope with living a random life. Um, we just don't like change. The brain convinces us. I mean, think about your morning routine. How often do you actually change it? We don't. We live routines. Our brain programs us to, because our brain then has spare capacity to do what it needs to do, which is to scan to stay alive, looking for lions and tigers, which is how we are primitively programmed. The cynicism of change is not new. Gaius Petronius, during the time of Nero, a few thousand years ago, said that. He was a soldier, fought the Egyptians, and then was a politician, a senator. And so when involved in change, you've got to overcome the cynicism of change. McKinsey say 70% of change fails to happen. Why does it fail to happen? It fails to happen because people don't overcome cynicism and fear, the lack of applied knowledge. People don't have the knowledge to undertake the change. They don't have the new skills required to undertake the change. Um, hidden conflicts that undermine your efforts. I've only got one year to go. I retire. There's no way I'm changing. If anyone thinks I'm leaving my corner office, it took me 25 years to negotiate, they've got another thing coming. And so there are all sorts of strange counter-change terrorists at work. And then unwritten rules that work against change. It's not the way we do things around here. It's called culture. Um, so it implies criticism. We have to change the dairy industry because you're all crap farmers. Sorry about that, but it's just one of those unpalatable truths. Yeah, well, we don't like that. Sod off, Waters. We're not going to listen to you anymore. It implies personal criticism. It changes power and status. It affects job security. Do I have a job in this new structure? It introduces risk. We don't do it like that. I moved into our Joint Services Command and Staff College as a directing staff at the age of 45. Up until that stage, I didn't know what a keyboard was. I moved into a paperless staff college where everything was done on the intranet. I didn't even know what an intranet was. So at the age of 45, I had to learn to type. It was a very painful process. It involved an awful lot of risk. It involved an awful lot of problems with my status, my position, and my sense of self. I just finished being a battalion commander. I was responsible for 650 people for two years in Northern Ireland on counter-terrorist operations. I was quite good at my job. No, I wasn't. I was crap because I couldn't type. That was a real change. And we don't like it. And I, shall I go, or shall I knuckle down and learn to type? It was a long, slow process. I still use two fingers. Um, rejection of ideas from outside. Consultants, we bring in consultants because we want a fresh set of eyes. But we like consultants because their ideas are easy to reject because they're not our ideas. And all they're doing anyway is borrowing our watch to tell us the time. Speed of change. It's too fast. Slow it down. We can't cape. What about the external rate of change? It's not slowing down. It doesn't matter. We need a stop. We need to gather ourselves. We're not logical. We're not rational actors. We're emotional beings. That's the way we're constructed. <coughs> and that psychologists have even come up with a term for this. They call it the status quo bias. We like things the way they are. And if you just think about it, we do. We like things the way they are. We're comfortable. We're secure. Sorry, you'd have to be a 1980s person to get to my slight cynicism there. Um, so why do we need to change? We've either sensed signals or we're in a crisis.
Kurt Lewin, 1947, the father of change theories. His was the first theory of change. A very simple three-stage step. Use the analogy of water and ice. He said, you can't move ice very easily. You've got to melt it into water. Then it flows around all the obstacles. So the first thing you've got to do is unfreeze. You've then got to change, and you then freeze, because we can't cope with staying in change, and we recognize that. And so unfreezing, overcoming inertia, Overcoming systems, overcoming the existing mindset. Remember, it's partly process, partly people. And for people, it's a mental attitude. You've got to overcome the mindset that change isn't necessary. And having done that, you do a very quick piece of analysis. Force field analysis is what he called it. You look at the forces for change, and you look at the forces resisting change. And a very objective sometimes your account, your, your external consultants in. Come and have a look at us, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Tell us if we're ready to change or not. And they objectively tell you. And if you're not ready to change, don't bother, because it won't happen. So you've got to wait for the forces, forces resisting change. He then said you change. It's a horrible, messy process. It's not linear. It's not logical. It's emotional, and it's awful. And as long as you're prepared for that, you'll be fine. And then afterwards, we consolidate the new processes, bring the new mindset into place, and get ready for the next round of change. But before you begin to change, you've got to know where you are. It's a simple navigational point. If you're going to go from A to B, it's all very well knowing where B is that you're going to, but if you're not setting off from a known point, you're never going to get there. So if you want to really understand an organization, try and change it. Things will come and bite you that you didn't understand. And McKinsey's 7S model, uh, Peace and Waterman is one of the sort of standard business school models for understanding an organization. And then you'll understand that if you change a system, what, what's its impact on the skills required and the staff and the style of leadership through the shared values and eventually the structure? But I'm only changing one system. No, that one system will impact on everything else in the organization. And unless you can track it and follow it and understand the cause and effect of your change, then your change will be derailed because you'll be derailed by things you didn't understand. When we were um, in Iraq, and I was tasked with initially the tame problem of reforming Iraq's police force in 1995. That's what we thought the problem was, reforming Iraq's police force. That wasn't the problem at all. That was the tame problem. The wicked problem was reforming its Ministry of Interior. And that really was a wicked problem in both senses of the word. And I used Cotter's eight-step model, and it really does work. And what Cotter did is he took Lewin's three steps, and through about 30 years of research with his PhD students at Harvard University, he reverse-engineered a model of change. And so the things that went wrong with change, he then put in as the steps of change, because you're putting in steps to address what goes wrong. He reckoned 85% of change fails to achieve all their objectives. And these are his eight steps. He says the first thing is establish a sense of urgency. There's got to be a reason for change. What is it? Why are we changing? Don't know. You know, it's like new person, we change. No, people have to buy into it. You have to establish a sense of urgency. If you don't change, you don't have a job. That's good. Let's change. Form a powerful guiding coalition from across the structure, from the youngest, newest entrant through the go-to person, Jenny, who's in accounts, who everyone goes to to find something out because she's been there for donkey's years, knows everything. If you ignore Jenny in the change process, your process is doomed. So form a guiding, powerful coalition. Then create a vision. If you create a vision at the beginning, it's only an illusion. It's a mirage. Because no one will believe it. Because there isn't a sense of urgency for change, and you haven't embedded a powerful guiding coalition to talk up the need for change and to support the vision. So the vision becomes a joke. And so... After the vision, communicate, communicate, communicate. And communicate appropriately. Empower others to act on the vision. So you're empowering the guiding coalition to act on the vision. You are distributing the leadership responsibility. You cannot drive change from the top. Change must be driven from across the organization. So people right across the organization must be empowered to change. 
plan for and create short-term wins. In, on 30th of January, 1990, no, I'm in the wrong country, 2005, get my date right. 30th of January, 2005, Iraq had its first ever free and fair elections. They'd never had elections before. We ruled the country until 1958. We never gave them elections. And then they took over and they didn't give themselves elections because they just had a series of tyrants. And so first ever election in the country. The Ministry of Interior and Iraq's police force would be front and center for managing the security of Iraq's first free election. That was a bit of a tall order because when we took over the Ministry of Interior three months earlier, the only people they could communicate with was Baghdad. They couldn't communicate with the rest of Iraq with its 17 other provinces. And so we had a bit of work to do. We had to create the conditions that would enable the demonstration that the Ministry of Interior and the police had changed and could manage the security of the elections. There was half the American army just outside the polling booths with its four policemen, but it was the policemen the people saw when they dipped their finger in the purple ink and waved it to the media that they've voted. Democracy isn't always the answer we later discover, but anyway. Um, Constitutionalise improvements and produce still more change. Institutionalise the approaches. And then go back to the beginning again, because it won't be long before you're having to keep up with the external rate of change. It really does work. It gives you a structure. And we like structures. We can peg things on them. And if you look, you can see the three areas of Lewin. The unfreeze the change and the freeze. I mentioned this earlier. If, if, if you're not familiar with this tool, it is terribly powerful. Um, in 2008, I was commander of British forces Kosovo. Uh, it transitioned from being a province of Serbia to a nation state, then the world's latest nation state, courtesy of, the, of American requirements. And um, we sat down uh, and we looked at Kosovo as a nation state in terms of its internal and external security. And we use this framework, the SWOT analysis. Each of the boxes had between 130 and 250 bullets. Um, we then worked out a system to link the bullets, so we numbered them 1 to 135, 1 to 147. And each one would equal 1, and 5 would equal 5 in each of them. And you end up with a really powerful structure of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Internal strengths and weaknesses, external opportunities and threats. And it really works very well. I commend it to you. People, how do you lead them through change? A, a point James talked about, leading people through change. This is as good a curve I've ever come across. It's based on the grievance curve. It's called, uh, Fisher developed it. It begins with the event of change and the initial anxiety and that goes through either to denial, it ain't going to happen, or happiness. Always told you this place should change, haven't I, for years around the water fountain? Always me. I've always said it should change. And then immediate fear. Oh, my gosh, we are changing after all. We can, talking about it's one thing, doing it is another. Do I have a job? And so we go through fear. A threat. Everything's a threat. Everything's a threat to me. I'm a threat to everything else in this new change, because I don't quite know what the end state of this change will be. Now suddenly guilt. I'm going to survive, but my best friend is going to be made redundant, and his whole department is going up the swanee, and I feel awful. I've got survivor guilt. I then go, oh, well, not too bad. He's got a good settlement. And I go through gradual acceptance, and I move forward. Or I go into deep depression, and I become an anti-change terrorist. Now, if you're a leader, if you're a manager of an organization undergoing change, you will go through that as well, up to here, and you might do it in five minutes. Uh, oh, uh, oh, it's OK. But what about your team? What about those three or four levels down in the organization? How are they feeling? Do you understand them? Do you know Jenny in accounts? Is she in happiness, fear, threat, guilt? Has she gone into depression? Do we need to pull her out of depression and get her back up on gradual acceptance? Has anyone told us she's still got a job? Are we communicating? And so everybody will go through this curve at a different rate. And so you've got to lead your people through the change curve. 
And so how do we make this change? Well, we have to have a strategy. And we start with a strategy of where we are, which is normally where we don't want to be. That's Mordor. Um, and then we go to what Churchill eloquently described as the sunlit uplands, which is a brilliant vision for the future because it's not too specific. <coughs> And then we have a strategy to achieve the change. And that's so simple, it's a straight line from where you are to where you want to be. And then you get on with it. And you march down the road of change to the sunlit uplands. And it's all about the end where you want to go, the way to get there, and the means to facilitate the way to the end. But of course, it's not really like that. Um, you know where you want to be, you've worked out where you are, and you come up with an idea of how you're going to get there. And you have an intended strategy. And this is a, a piece of work. Um, yeah, I said Mintzberg, Henry Mintzberg is probably the guy who deserves the credit for it. And he called this emergent strategy. Because the previous model was a deliberate strategy. We know what we're going to do. We never know what's going to happen tomorrow. There are so many variables we don't control. We don't control currency rates. We don't control climate. We don't control government elections. We don't control EU policy. There are lots of things we don't control that are going to knock our strategy off. So we've got to be able to, what I love to describe as surf the wave of chaos, which is the root. And so we begin with an intended strategy, which we develop into our deliberate strategy. Uh, I worked for a year with the Americans um, as a planner, and they love deliberate strategy. They're masters of it. And they can eloquently show it in PowerPoint. And what they don't like is when it doesn't work, because you can't control the future. And in Iraq, we could not control the insurgency. We could not control Iran's intent. We couldn't control the fact that if we are going to introduce a democracy, and there are 60% Shia loyal to Iran, and there are 40% Sunni loyal to themselves, um, the Shia are going to rule the Sunni. The Sunni had ruled the Shia for the preceding 50 years because we empowered the Sunni to govern the Shia because we couldn't govern them when we ran the country. And so the empire struck back in the form of Iran. And democracy created an Iran-focused government of Iraq which screwed all our plans. And so we ended up with an unrealized strategy. And we then had to work through the emergent strategy in order to deliver a realized strategy. And if you look at the recent history of Iraq and current events there, you'll know we're still a long way off. Um, and the realized strategy has re-emerged into the emergent strategy. And that's where we are at the moment. Um, we still think we know where we want to be, which was the original vision for Iraq, which was a nation at peace with itself and a force for good in the region. That's a sunlit upland. Um, identity and culture, coming to an end now. I said earlier, the thing that will most derail change is the way we do things around here, and you're not changing those, and that's called culture. There's a sign in the uh, boardroom of the Ford Works in Detroit, the boardroom in Detroit of the Ford Motor Company, which says, culture will eat your strategy for breakfast. That's why you haven't seen as many Fords on the road as you used to. Because Ford thought from a small boardroom in Detroit, they could run a global industry and impose Fordism on every culture in the world. It didn't work in Dagenham. Um, and so what is culture? It's what we do. It's the norms of our society. But it's only good for us. It isn't good for anyone else. And Ed Shine talked about it on three levels. Artifacts, the outward manifestations. Espouse values, what people say about the way things are supposed to be. And finally, the bedrock, the basic assumptions. In a change program, it's quite easy to change artifacts. With negotiation, it's quite easy to change espouse values. But you mess with people's basic assumptions, and they'll have none of it. They'll leave. They'll find a job somewhere else. Because you've crossed a line. And so if you haven't mapped, as part of knowing where you are at the beginning, what your organization's artifacts, values, and basic assumptions are, then you can't invoke a change program. Because if you mistake an artifact for a basic assumption, you derail the change program. Take, for example, a flag. Now, the union flag, or jack, is that an artifact and espouse value or a basic assumption, do you think? Where is it in your heart? 
the Union Jack. We were about to lose the blue pit pits a while ago, weren't we? When our friends in the north were going on their own. Stayed by a narrow margin. So we'd have lost the blue bits to the flag. Would that have impacted hugely on the flag? What do you think about the Union Jack? Is an artifact a spouse value or a basic assumption? Artifact. I think it probably is an artifact. Um, when I work with the Americans, I discover that old glory is not an artifact. Old glory is a basic assumption. Mess with old glory, the flag of the United States of America, and you're, you're just dead. They revere their flag in a way that we just don't. And so we have two different cultural approaches to a simple thing like a flag by two countries divided by our common language. And that's the end. Who who might be best placed either within the family or outside the family to escape the change? Because what the end result could like, look like is it's pretty rosy, but it's getting from A to B, isn't it? And uh, who, who or what is best placed to instigate that change and follow through? I have to. I I I I've got one here. I like the idea of the um, New Zealand model, the gentleman mentioned earlier, where you have some thought leaders who are masters or mistresses of best practice, uh, who can come along and guide people, explain to them why they need to change, and then maybe share with them how they do the changing. And I, I don't see any member of the family likely to do it. I think it will probably be externally. In the current model I saw, it's probably the bank manager. But I prefer the, the idea of the, the champion coming in and saying, you know, you're, 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 you're a great family, you're a super pair of farmers, but this ain't going to work. And, and I think that the question of, you know, how is mum and dad going to live when they've transitioned the farm? On what are they going to live? And is the farm going to have to provide at least a retirement income as well as a working income? And that's certainly some of my friends who are farmers is one of the things they're facing now um, because mum and dad didn't save. Um, and so I, th I think it, it, it probably needs to be externally driven because I doubt if the family understand the crisis enough because of their status quo bias. <laughs>